So it's my, my pleasure again to welcome you to the third day of this amazing teaching and learning conference. Um, can I just check, how many of you are here today for the first, first time, one day is? Great, thank you very much for coming. I think you're going to have a fabulous day if the last two days are anything to go by. Um, some of the things that we've covered in the past two days is a, a really good look at what is a global graduate and what kind of teachers do we need for global graduates. Um, we've looked at global challenges and developments and we've got actually a, a global delegation here. We've got people from Australasia, Asia, Middle East, Europe, UK of course, which says to me that we've actually got a global community of, of delegates here and it's a great opportunity to learn from each other. And I think what's really struck me is the passion that I'm seeing um, amongst you as delegates for teaching and learning your own professional practice, which is really very, very inspiring, I have to say. <clears throat> so some of the other things that you missed, um, we had a great barbecue on Monday night, so it's worth coming for the three days just for that. Last night we had a very stimulating debate. Um, how many of you were here last night? Oh good, lovely to see you back, because there's quite a lot going on in the bar as well. But the debate was fascinating. We had people arguing passionately for what they believed in, arguing passionately for what they didn't believe in, which I thought was very impressive, arguing passionately for things nothing to do with the motion, but they were very passionate about it. And I think generally we had good fun. Um, and, and the outcome was people in the end voted for free um, higher education for all, if we really want to be global. So that was great. We've had over 400 sessions, still some to come, 500 presenters. We've got poster exhibitions and, and an exhibition as well. So I encourage you to take part as fully as you can today. Um, most of all, I encourage you to enjoy yourselves. I mean, I went to a session on humor, and we're still laughing about it now. So um, a great event. The, how many people have here been here for three days? Oh, wow, well done. You get the prize for stamina. It's a bit of <laughs> this is a marathon, not a sprint, isn't it, clearly? So, um, excellent. Well, I think that's enough for me. Um, I just need to say I'm very sorry once I've introduced Shai, as I will in a minute, I have to disappear because I only recently have come into the role and this wasn't in my diary, um, but I've had fabulous time when I've actually managed to be here. So let me introduce you to our keynote speaker today, Shai Reshef. So if you were at the debate last night, you've got a flavor of where Shai's coming from. He is the president of the University of People, the world's first tuition-free, non-profit, accredited online academic institution, really dedicated to opening up access to education for everybody. How would you describe Shai? Well, in the words of others, he is described as an education entrepreneur. Um, I think that says it all, really, Shai. Uh, also, he is showered with awards. Now, I know it's in the program and you can read it for yourself, but just a few of them. The Fast Company 100 Most Creative People in Business. One World as one of its people of 2009. The Huffington Post as the ultimate game changer in education. Wired Magazine's 50 People Changing the World. Top Global Thinker by the Foreign Policy Magazine. We are so fortunate to have you here today, Shai. Thank you for coming. We really look forward to what you're going to tell us about the education revolution and how online learning will solve all our problems, particularly for the future of higher education. A very warm welcome. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. And I would like to start by introducing you to Mariam. Mariam from Aleppo. She grew in Aleppo. She was born there, grew up there, went to high school, graduated high school, and then the war started. She had no hope. She had no future. Moreover, she had to evacuate her home three times. She left it, came back, left it, came back. Then she realized that their, whole, their only hope for a bright future is through education. But there are no institutions in Aleppo that are open, and there are no other opportunities in Syria. So she searched the net and found University of the People. She started studying with us. She's going every other day to a store next to her house to charge her laptop and her cell phone and use hotspot back home to get, to get um, 
internet to her laptop and study with a candlelight. This is University of the People. The first ever non-profit, tuition-free, accredited online university opening the gates to higher education to for everyone. And let me give you a few examples of what I mean by everyone. Meet Malik. Malik is from Pennsylvania, US. Regular student, went to a university, and then realized that he is accumulating debt that he will never be able to pay back. You know the situation here. You know that education even, is even more expensive in the US. Malik realized that no way he will ever be able to pay back the debt. So he said, let me drop out of school, work a little bit, raise money, and then go back to school. So he found a job in New York. He quit, quitted, went to New York, came to Penn Station, called the place that he got the job in, just to learn that the, the job is not, he, is not there for him anymore. So here he is in Penn Station with a backpack, with a few clothes, $20 bill, no place to live, no place to work, and no university to go back to. So he became homeless in Penn Station. For a month, he used to live on the floor. He had an agreement with a store in Penn Station to clean the store every night in return for keeping his bag, his backpack, at night there. He was afraid. He was sleeping on the floor on the, uh, in Penn Station, and he was afraid. After a few months, he found a job selling tickets in the Madison Square Garden. For those of you who don't know, it's just above Penn Station. And he started rebuilding his life. He found a place to live. He started having enough, uh, enough money to go by. But he realized that he has no future. He can't go anywhere being selling ticket in Madison Square Garden. And the only way for him to move up is through education. But he couldn't afford. He had huge loan. And he couldn't afford going to any university. So he searched the net until he found University of the People. Actually, now, a few years uh, later, he's not only started his own business, he's running for Congress. Meet, uh, which I'm not sure that we should be proud of, but that's a different story. Meet Magda. Magda was born in Mexico. By the age of nine, she came to the US as undocumented student. You know the situation of the undocumented uh, people in the US, those who Trump is now trying to kick them back to, to Mexico or, and, and at the same time big, building the wall so no more will, uh, will continue to come. However, Magda came to the US and she grew up in the US and for her, US is the only place that she, she knows. She actually didn't even know that she's undocumented until she got to the age of 18. She graduated high school, but then she realized that she can't find a job, at least a legal job, because she doesn't have documents, and she can't study in any university with a state tuition, which means that she cannot afford it. So she's starting working illegally as a receptionist in a company, and searched the net until she found University of the People. By now, while she was studying with us, she got promoted. She became legal because of Obama um, new regulations for DACA students. And she's now in charge of 300 accounts in her place. Last but not least is Adeyami. Adeyami is from Nigeria. He grew up in a country where he went to high school, passed the university and entrance exams, and was ready to go to school. In Nigeria, every year, there are 1.7 million students who pass the university exams. However, there are seats available only for 600,000 seats, which means that 1.1 million students qualified for higher education do not have seats simply a lost generation. He was searching the net, 
until he found University of the People. So this is University of the People, and we are for those that UNESCO described as the next lost generation. There are, there will be, in 2025, in, um, according to UNESCO, 98 million students will be deprived from seats in the existing universities. If you look at the growth of the population of the world, and you look at the, growth, at the new opening of new universities, there will be close to 100 million students who will simply would not have seats in the, in, the existing univer, in the existing universities. And think what a, what a waste it will be uh, for our world. And for those people, we actually started University of the People. In our universities, there are seats for everyone. In our online classrooms, nobody needs to stand at the back of the lecture hall. We open the gates to higher education for everyone. For me, when I announced the University of the People, it was kind of a change in my life. I was in charge of educational programs for hundreds of thousands of uh, students through tens of programs for over 20 years. Among other things, I started the first for-profit online university in Europe through partnership with the University of Liverpool. So University of Liverpool Online, which I guess that some of you at least heard of, is my creation. We started it in the, in the Netherlands, and we actually deliver the online degrees of University of Liverpool online. And for me, it was a great revelation, because that was when I realized how powerful online learning can be. We had students from all over the world. We had students in Singapore, for example, that, that can stay at home, keep their job, and still get this great European education. But I also realized that for most people, it was simply, it was a, wish, a wishful thinking. It was simply too expensive. You know, in the US, people used to pay for education. People get, to, get used to pay here as well. But in many parts of the world, people cannot pay, do not, are not used to pay for higher education, cannot afford paying for higher education. And for me, it was kind of, wow, here we have a great product that can help a lot of people, but they cannot afford it. I ended up selling uh, that university. It was called KIT Learning. Uh, so I sold this university to Laureate. Later on, I sold the rest of my business, and I went to New York um, on a semi-retirement just to realize that it's not really for me. I'm a little bit hyper. I need to continue doing. So I said, okay, I want to continue, but I don't want to do more of the same. I feel that I'm fortunate. I have enough. It's my turn to give back. And for me to give back should have been in a way that will have an impact on the world. And having impact on the world is education. Because as you know it more than anyone else, if you educate one person, you can change a life. But if you educate many, you can change the world. So I looked around, and I realized that everything that made this European university so expensive is available for free. Open source technology, which is technology that people produce for everyone to use for free. Open educational, res op open educational resources content that people produce and put on the net for everyone to use for free, and the new internet culture where people share, teach, and learn from each other for free. And I found websites where professors are coming online and help students for free. And I said, wait a second. If you have all these ingredients, content, technology, and teachers, all you need to do is to put it together and create a tuition-free university. So that's what I did. And I created University of the People in 2009, 
the first nonprofit tuition free American accredited online, online university. That happened 10 years ago, or almost 10 years ago, from a January, well, we announced the university in January 2009. We started teaching in September 2009. So this coming September, we're entering our 10th, 10th year. So it started almost 10 years ago and see where, see where we are. We have over 15, thousand students coming from over 200 countries and territories. There are no 200 countries in the world, so it includes some territories. So they're coming literally from every corner of the world, from the United States to the United Arab Emirates, from Indonesia to Bolivia, from South Sudan to Azerbaijan. We run the university by volunteers. We have 7,000 volunteers who came on board to help us. Actually, the day that we announced the university in 2009, the next day, the New York Times wrote a page about us. And a day later, we already had hundreds of emails of professors saying, this is a great idea. We want it to help you make it happen. So the university is mainly run by 7,000 volunteers. And these volunteers, look where they are coming from. Our president council, chaired by John Sexton, president emeritus of NYU, Nick Dirks, chancellor of uh, UC Berkeley, Cappy Bond Hill, a president of uh, Vassar, most of them, by the way, are emeritus and um, or former, Sir Colin Lucas, uh, the vice chancellor of Oxford, Tim O'Shea, the vice chancellor of, uh, of Edinburgh, George Rapp, the president of Columbia University, Thorsten Wiesel, president of Rockefeller University, a Nobel Prize winner, and, as you can see, many, many more. Our president, our president form um, include Dave, David Cohen uh, from uh, Columbia University, Roxy Smith, who used to be the vice, the vice uh, provost of uh, Columbia universities and our deans are coming from uh, NYU and, and uh, Princeton. Our top academic leadership, all of them are volunteers, are coming from the top universities of the world, from Harvard, MIT, Yale, uh, Stanford, um, actually, and from the UK, UK as well. We are partnering with Yale Law School for research, with NYU to accept students, for, for Ber for, with Berkeley to enable our associate degree graduates, associate degree is American two years degree, to transfer to Berkeley to complete their BA on campus with generous uh, scholarship and for our Syrian refugees in the UK to transfer to, uh, to Edinburgh to complete their, uh, their BA. We are, um, we get a lot of uh, exposure. This is our main way to spread the word. We had over 3,000 articles about us, from the BBC to the CNN, ABC, New York Times, Times Higher Education, all those um, media outlets that spread the word, that help us spread the word to the students who uh, need to know about us. We have 1.2 million supporters on Facebook and over 5 million people watched a TED talk that I gave. And this is important because we do not have marketing budget or to be accurate, we have a minimal uh, marketing budget. Our only way to spread the word to make sure that the students who need us most, these 100 million students that I was talking about, know about us is either through the media or through social media where we try to be engaged as much as, much as we can to spread the word. <clears throat> we only offer business administration, computer science, and health science, associate and bachelor degree, as well as MBA. We chose those programs because they are the highest in demand 
worldwide. And the students who come to us come in order to have a better future. So we chose the degrees that are most likely help them find a job, have a better future, helping them, their families, their communities, and their, uh, and their countries. Our students are not typical students. Most of our students are those who have no other opportunity. We are the only opportunity for them to get higher education. We have survivors of the genocide in Rwanda, survivors of the earthquake in Haiti, actually, that's the students that you see here, people who barely make a living. We currently have a thousand refugees. We took out of them, 600 of them are Syrian, 300 of the Syrian are still in Syria. We took more Syrian refugees than any university in the world, and actually, given the resources, we will, we will open the gates even further for Syrian refugees. We actually build a university for them. We're very proud to enable them to study. We are the opportunity, as I said, for those who have no other opportunity. But because many of them are coming from hardship, coming with a very, very difficult situation, we put them, we give them personalized attention. And as such, when they sign up with us and they start studying with us, we put them in small classes of 20 to 30 to 30 students. Every time they take a class, it's eight weeks long. We actually teach, we have five terms a year. Each term is eight weeks, it's actually 10 weeks, but eight weeks of studies and then exam. But we do it obviously in, a, in virtual classes. Every week starts on Thursday, ends on Wednesday to ensure that every, stu every student from every part of the world um, experience the weekend in the, mid, in the middle of their study week. When our students come to our classroom, they find in our classroom the 20 to 30 students like themselves, most likely from 20 to 30 countries around the world. And every time they take a class, we mix them with 20 to 30 new students from 20 to 30 uh, new, new countries. Every week when they go to the class, they find there the profile of their peers. Only them and the instructor can go into the classroom. And then every week, they find the lecture notes of the week, the reading assignment, the homework assignment, and the discussion question. And the discussion question is the core of our studies. So to explain how it works, if some of you still don't, don't know how it works. Let's take an example. Let's say that Thursday morning, a new week starts, and the first students who go into the classroom is Chinese, simply because the morning starts earlier in China. So he will go into the class. He will read the notes of the week. He will read the homework, the reading assignment of the week, and he will see the discussion question and he will put his own contribution to the class discussion. The next student will be Indonesian, and she will do the same. But at that time, she already see what the Chinese wrote, so she will comment on the Chinese. And let's say that the third student is Syrian, and he will do the same, and he will see what the Chinese wrote and what the Indonesian wrote, and he will comment as well. And let's say that the fourth one will be from the UK, and will do the same. And the Chinese is very likely to go back to the class and see what people had to say about his uh, contribution. And he will, he will write back. So the entire week, actually, the students communicate between each other. So every student must have at least one original contribution every week, and at least five times comment on what other people say and the discussion develop between themselves. 
while the instructor is there every day of the week to read everything that is going on, to correct mistakes. He's, the instructor is not supposed to get involved unless if there is need to, correcting mistakes. Someone asked a question nobody was able to answer, or maybe the discussion went to the wrong direction and needs to be redirected. By the end of the week, the students take a quiz, hand in their homework, which is assessed anonymously and randomly by three of their peers, and take a quiz, get a grade, and move to the next week. The role of the instructor is to moderate the discussion, but also to be able to, to override grades if he feels that the grades that the students gave to each other are not fair, and to be there for the students if they need to. Every student, in addition to the, prog in the, in addition to the instructor, has a program advisor. We set up, we set up a system where for every student there is a program advisor which acts as a single point of contact at the university. Students in general, but definitely in our, situ in our case, are confused. There are so many offices in the university, they get so many emails that they just don't know how to deal with. So they have a single person, con person uh, that is actually their contact person at the university from the day they sign up until they graduate to answer every question that they have and to help them if they have any issues. And obviously also, very important thing, is to motivate them when they need this motivation. By the end of, as I said, it's eight weeks long every, every, uh, every course. By the nine weeks, they take a final exam. The exams are proctored by a live proctor in 200 countries. They get um, their grades and move to the next course. It's very challenging. Studying with us requires 15 to 20 hours per week per course. We don't let the students take more than two courses at a time. Full time is two courses, unless they have exceptional grades and they want to study three courses, so they need a special permission. Otherwise, two courses uh, is, a, is, is a, the maximum they can study. And if you make the calculation, 10 weeks, every 10 weeks we start the term, in order to graduate in four years as a regular American program, they need to take two courses each term, five terms a year for four years. They take a break, it takes them long, longer. Since most of our students either coming from hardship, but in addition, usually work well when they're studying with us, our students are slightly older than typical students. Uh, they take it slower, they take breaks, they take one course at a time, and for that reason, we let them up to 10 years to complete their, um, their BA. While it is, it is very demanding and ask them for 15 to 20 hours a week, um, it's, it's very interactive. While they are alone, obviously with no, um, no physical classroom, they all the time interact with their peer and it is very, satis very satisfying. We ask the students every term 40 questions. We are savvy on data and collecting information about the students. So we ask them 40 students, anything from how do you like the material to the instructor to the technology to any question that you can think about. But there is one question that I look at, which is the last question. Would you recommend the university to your peers as a good place of studying? 95% of them every single term say that they would. So uh, I guess that uh, we're doing, I guess, something right. Um, any student with high school diploma and uh, fluency in English can start studying with us. However, when they start studying with us, it's, they take two courses before we accept them as regular students. Our way to ensure our mission 
And our mission is to have, high, to have quality university which is accessible and affordable. As such, any student with high school, high school diploma and sufficient English is welcome to start. They start with us, they take two courses. One course is uh, online strategies, basically teaching them how, what it is, how, to, how it is to study with us, what they need to know, uh, cultural differences, what is politically correct and incorrect, what is plagiarism, etc. And the second course is the course of their field of study, whether it is business administration, computer science, or health science, basically to show them what it is that they are getting into. They have to pass these two courses. If they pass these two courses, they meet our standards, they are welcome to continue with us. If not, they cannot. Just to understand how significant it is, we, we lose way over 50% of the students right there. So some of them, it's because, oh, it's tuition free, I'll sign up and get a free degree by mail. Well, they realize that they don't get a degree free, but many of them don't realize how hard it is. For many of them, they can't fit it into their schedule. While we tell them it's 15 to 20 hours a week per course, they say, well, I can make it two, with two hours. Well, they cannot. And many of them don't like sitting alone. Many of them don't like peer-to-peer -peer learning. And as I mentioned, it's a discussion between students. Students grade each other. So maybe it's not for them. But maybe it's just what we ask them is too hard for them and they can't make it. But what we experience is that those who pass these two courses doing amazingly well, 85% of them continue to second year, which is very high percentage uh, in U.S. terms, considering the background of, um, of our students. Uh, as I mentioned, everything is text. I said the lecture notes of the week. I said discussion between the students. Many of our students do not have broadband. As such, we don't force them to use video or audio. Everything is text. Recently, we introduce video as option. So you, you have a video, wa go watch a MOOC course, go watch a Yale video, great. It's never mandatory. They don't have to do it in order, in order to succeed. We are tuition free, but we are not free. The students sign up for free, take the courses for free, but by the end of the course, we expect them to pay $100 for the assessment, for assessment fee. They can take actually the exam without paying. They can't continue unless they pay the assessment fee. That means that for a student to study full time with us, it will cost $1,000 a year or $4,000 for, um, for a full degree. For those who cannot afford even the $100, we offer scholarship. And we are very grateful to have partners to enable us to give scholarship to our students. So Microsoft uh, secured scholarship for uh, students in Africa where they uh, choose the students, give them mentorship, internship, while they obviously pay them fully to study with us, give them a mentorship, um, and internship while they're studying with us and then offer them jobs uh, when they graduate. HP created a scholarship program, especially for women, which also get mentored by HP um, executive. Intel has put together a scholarship program for women in Haiti. Foundation Hoffman created general scholarship uh, for students as well as a scholarship for our Syrian refugees. Our Syrian refugees are mainly uh, sponsored by uh, Hoffman Foundation as well as Oak, uh, as Oak Foundation. And other individuals, corporate and the foundation, such as the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, either support our ongoing work or pay for specific projects. We're also very proud to be supported by corporates. We actually supported by corporates both 
again, to offer scholarships for our students, but also uh, to work with our graduates. We're a young university. I mentioned that we have over 15,000 students, but four years ago, when we got our initial accreditation, and in the U.S. you need to start, you need to have a few graduates when, when you uh, can, can get your accreditation. So four years ago, we had 500 students. We're doubling the number every year. So now we have 15,000 students. We expect actually to continue doubling the number. But that also means that we start having graduates. And while we don't have tons of graduates, we have about 400 of them, we're extremely proud of how well they're doing. We have graduates who work with Apple, with IBM, with Microsoft, with uh, the World Bank, Wells Fargo, uh, the UN. Uh, we are very proud of their, of their uh, achievement. Actually, 92% of our graduates um, say that they are employed, and we feel that it's quite a nice achievement. And as I said, they are all over the world. As I mentioned before, our students come to us in order to have a better future. However, for us, there is a greater benefit. By the time students graduate, they've interacted through the virtual classroom with students from the entire globe. Because in every class, there are 25 students, 20 to 30 students. And every time they take a class, they meet 20 to 25 new students from new, from new countries. With the average of 40 classes per program, by the time they graduate, students literally met 100 students from every corner of the world. The reason this is so great is because, imagine, imagine what happened when students from Pakistan and India study together. Imagine what happened when students from Turkey and Greece study together. Imagine what happened when students from Israel and Palestine study together. They learn to get along. They learn to get to know each other and to respect each other. We open their mind. We develop a shift in attitude, which is often carried outside of outside of the class. Instead of being enemies outside of the class, they become friends. This is the University of the People. We open the gates to higher education to everyone. Give the students a better chance for the future, offering the world a better chance for peace. Just imagine one million students walking through our doors. Thank you. Absolutely inspirational uh, keynote for us all. I think a lot to think on about how we could change our models of higher education to be more accessible to all people. We'll start, start our, our question, question and answer, answer session now, if that's okay. Shai, any questions from the floor? I'm Anne Wilson from the Royal Literary Fund. I don't know about anybody else, but I, perhaps some, some people like me are sitting completely stunned by your vision. Um, and I would like to know what skills you have accumulated over your life that enabled you to mobilize all those people and all those corporations to make this happen? Well. Thank you, and thank you for the assumption behind your question, which I am not sure that I stand behind. I'm not sure it's my skills. Um, well, I am an, an entrepreneur. All my life I had businesses, and almost all of them in education. To be honest, it's not me. It's the idea. People don't come because of me. People don't do what they do because of me. They do because of the idea. Because so many people believe that 
It just doesn't make sense where higher education is getting into. And then there is the technology that enables us to bring the education to them, so why not? So basically, we came and said it can be done, and people said, wow, great idea, let, let, us, uh, let us join and make it happen. You saw the president. I never convinced them to come. They came to us. John Sexton is the first one who approached me, and I leave aside all the theatrical things that was involved in him <laughs> approaching me, and, and he basically said, listen, we at NYU charge 50, over $50,000 a year per student tuition. We must charge it in order, con con in order to be able to continue being a great research university. But our only justification to continue charging this amount is by having a cheaper alternative for those who cannot afford it. And you're paving the way, so I want you to succeed. So it's not me, it's the idea. Um, I think that yes, I mean, what makes us, you know, it's true that I came with the experience. I know how online universities run. So I have the experience. We use technology. And we have great people who come and help us. We are, what we do, hardly any university can do in terms of budget. And simply because we started from scratch, we started nine years ago, and we built everything from, from nothing. So we can just take the best technology and use it. We don't need to have to think about, without knowing you, I'm sure that one of the main challenges that you have as a university, how to integrate the different um, technologies that we use. Well, we use only one technology, Microsoft CRM. We took Microsoft CRM, which stands actually for Customers Relationship Management. It's a marketing um, product of uh, Microsoft. And we converted it to be university management system. And we do everything there. But it's extremely efficient. Our um, admission office are two people. That's it. How many people do you have in your admission? We have 15,000 students, right? So we, we do things. Everything is, is automatic. So we are able to do things differently because we are young and because we have so much support from great people who give us advice and help and pro bono. Um, yeah. But thank you anyway. <laughs> uh, Alex Connor, um, I'm the director of uh, master's level education at Birmingham Medical School. And one of our interna internationalization strategies is, is kind of a problem because of English fluency. Do you guys have any appetite for a foundation level English course that would bring people up to, I don't know, IELT level seven or so, so, so the people that aren't English fluent could, could access your, a, a business model might be working with universities who want to increase recruitment at master's level. Or we don't. And the reason for that is that we decided that we, we concentrate on what we do and what we do is a higher education and we don't go to the sites. Now, it's a, it's a big challenge. It's the number one reason for students not to study with us. Uh, you know, we were talking about Syrian refugees. Uh, and as I mentioned, we took 600 Syrian refugees. However, there are 200,000 200, Syrian refugees who were left out of uh, the universities and have no option. They can't make it in English. You need either to teach them English or to make a program in Arabic. We're thinking actually about the second one, creating you people in Arabic, but um, we don't do it. What we do if students come, the other challenge that, that our students have is that in order to be accepted to us, you need to show us first that you're fluent in English, which means either TOEFL or any, any other exam, but our students cannot afford taking even these exams. So what we, do, what we did, uh, we develop our own English course uh, which anyone who comes with English not as a native language or they haven't studied in a, in a school where English was the main language of instruction, uh, we tell them you should take this course, pass the exit exam to show us that your English is uh, good enough. Well, we improve a little bit their English in, their, in, their, in, this, in this course, but it's, you know, it's, it's not really an... 
I wish we would be able to do it. We know that it's, it's, it's a main challenge, the number one challenge that we're having. Uh, we haven't resolved this one, and it limits the number of people who can study with us. It's a good point. Uh, hi, Shay. Nick Fair from University of Southampton. Thank you for a, a wonderful, inspiring talk. I noticed at one point through you said um, that you were very savvy with your data, and I'm interested to know uh, what use you currently make of it and what opportunities you see for the future with regards to the data that you collect uh, from, from the learning process. What opportunity in general? Well, uh, one uh, for you as well. So, first, I think that we, we ourselves are now uh, rebuilding our dashboard to have ongoing information uh, of the students. And not only to have all the information, information of how well they do and where they are getting stuck. On top of it, we plan on building artificial intelligence to identify early when students are at risk of, of dropping out. Uh, this is extremely important because we realize that if you can intervene, you know, we all of us go through life, especially our students, we have difficulties where we're, the periods where things are harder and we want to give up. And if someone approach you at that moment and can convince you, just stick, just try a bit, a bit longer, it can make a huge difference. So we actually planning on developing artificial intelligence to predict better uh, when students are um, getting into trouble. The other thing that we are now exploring is to use um, chatbots for um, as TAs. And the idea is that uh, when you think about questions that students ask you, well, you know, it's the same question usually, again and again and again. And many of them, almost all of them, you can answer them automatically. And since we are online, everything is online, you can answer. And then it will enable us that the instructors will actually have much more time to spend with the students, to uh, focus on real problems or things that they really need help, that only the, the instructors can give them, and to improve results. I didn't mention it. I said we have 7,000 volunteers. We use about um, close to over 400 of them, close to 500, and they are doing everything, including being our instructors. Uh, Shai, uh, Don Pates, uh, educational technologist from City University of London. Uh, thank you again for uh, sharing this uh, inspiring story with, uh, with the room here. Um, I'm going to uh, horribly be the party pooper a little bit uh, here. Um, you described the, uh, the model for the University of the People that is uh, driven by technologies and principles that emerged from what we might understand to be the open internet. Uh, I wonder if you could comment a little on the current challenges to those technologies and principles, such as the uh, net neutrality issue in the US at the moment, or European copyright legislation that is being proposed at the moment. So, threats to the internet and uh, how that might relate to the university of the people in the future. Uh, talking about challenges in general that the university have, our number one challenge is um, spreading the word. 100 million people need to know about us, need to know that the opportunity is there. They don't. You have n most of you have never heard about us. Definitely not students in Sudan or Syria or uh, Afghanistan who need our services. So spreading the word is the number one challenge. The second challenge that goes with it is to have enough scholarships. As we grow, we need more and more scholarship for those who cannot afford even the $100 and the, our ability to raise scholarship is not is slower than our ability to grow in terms of students. The third challenge is actually the technology. Uh, we do feel, while it's, you know, it, it's scalable. We use the cloud, we use Microsoft, we, it is scalable. Uh, we have all the time more and more demands on uh, what we can do and how well it will work. Um, and I just was talking about what our next uh, um, challenge is, but you know, I think that uh, it's uh, just 
being better and being uh, giving better service. Yeah. Oh, this is Andrew Fokar from Lancaster University. Thanks very much, Shai. That was fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm, this is maybe me being a 20th century Luddite, but I'm interested in some of the things that you, you can't do when you're online. So computer science and business administration, I can see maybe you can do purely online. But with health science, it's not my field, but I would imagine there's value in people being physically together in a laboratory and doing some laboratory experiments and, and learning some laboratory skills. That would be the sort of thing that employers would be looking for in health science graduates. So how do you see that as a problem? And if so, how do you get around not never being in a physical space together and being able to do those sorts of things? No, it's a good point. There are things that you can do online. We chose the degrees that are most in demand, but also that you can do them online. By the way, when we launched the university and we had to decide which programs, we decided business administration and computer science because they are most in demand worldwide and will offer better future for our students. However, their health is much more in, much more in need in many countries. I mean, when you think about developing countries, health is slightly more important at their point of time than business administration. But we couldn't, we couldn't figure out how to do it because you need, you know, practical. How do you do practical? Uh, and only when uh, we realize that we can actually prepare health workers, we don't teach nursing. We don't teach uh, medical school. Actually, actually, it's public health. And we prepare people to work in the public health, health um, um, institutions. Now, it is true that many of our students in the health science are de facto nurses and doctors in developing countries who became nurses just because they practice, but they have no academic background whatsoever and use us in order to get the background. It's also true that our um, degree uh, is one, one you need in the US, you can take one more year practical experience and become a nurse, and it's a pre-med, you can go to medical school. But there are limitations. Um, there are people who solved it, you know, I know that by now there are online medical schools, but what they do, they study the theory online, they use virtual labs for part of the things, but the students go to physical places to, to get the practical experience. So. Everything that, that uh, needs a practical experience, we cannot make. Um, I, I hope it answers. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you very much for uh, uh, the, the talk. I'm, I'm here. I'm here, just below oh, okay. the previous person. <laughs> uh, Vince Knight from Cardiff University. Uh, I have some quest uh, questions about the, uh, the volunteer instructors, uh, of which I believe you said there were 500 of them at, at the moment. And so these, these volunteers, they're spending time looking at the uh, discussions and setting the students right if they're needed. I understand not all, all the time, but that's still, that still work. So I, I suppose my question is, A, what is your process for um, vetting or employing one of these, these volunteers? And, and B, how is the use of these volunteers scalable? The, the cloud technology is obviously scalable, but it, at some point the volunteers is not. Good, thanks. Uh, first of all, we, we have 7,000 instructors, well, professors, we use 500 of them. So talking about scalable, we still have a room to grow. All the people who come to us, um, first of all, in order for us to use them, they need to have an experience uh, in the same field. So they, they, need to, they need to have some experience teaching the same, the same course elsewhere. We vet it. And then they go into our training. Our training is two weeks, um, assuming they had some, some experience. And then they have another month of kind of a training on the job. And then their first course, they are being uh, mentored by uh, one of our senior instructors. Um, being, being instructor with us, it's, it's slightly different if, if, if you're not familiar with the with this kind of pedagogy, they are not in charge of the courses. SMEs, subject matter experts, professors that are well known in the field, write the courses for us. 
So they write the courses, we have peer review of the courses, we ask the people who write the course usually to teach them the first time so they can modify whatever needed, and then we give the courses to the instructors. The instructors do not have the freedom to change the course material. That's what they teach. That's enable us, first of all, to make sure that we maintain the quality, we know what they're supposed to teach, we make sure that the learning outcome of each course are actually the learning outcome that the students are supposed to, to get. And the instructors are there mainly uh, to, to mentor, the, to, to moderate the discussion and be there for the students. However, if they are not good enough, they are being, uh, they are being dismissed. They are volunteers, but they are being dismissed. And actually yesterday, over dinner, I, I just mentioned that we fired someone who sent me an email and said, how dare you fire me? I'm a volunteer. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, either you're up to our standards or you are not there. Um, it's a lot of work for the, for the instructors. It's 10 to 15 hours a week per course. It's a lot of work. They have to be in the class every day. They have to answer the students. Maximum, any student, max with, with um, 48 hours, but we expect them to answer any question with, uh, within 24 hours. But what can I say? We hardly have anyone who left us. Anyone who started nine years ago <laughs> They're still with us. Those who started six years ago are still with us. They, they love it. I mean, think about it. What a great opportunity it is for anyone who loves teaching to come and see and meet 20 students from 20 countries, amazing life stories. It's great. You're giving back, and you get much more to yourself. Um, but, but it is, uh, it is a, a, lot, a lot of work for them. Yeah. By the way, we have three kinds of uh, instructors. Either people who, who teach elsewhere and want to give back and want to do some, some uh, extra uh, for the society. Retired professors who find it amazing to spend their days. But also young uh, PhDs who want the experience and to have University of the People on their CVs. So, yeah. OK, thank you, Shai. I think we're going to have to uh, call it to a close at that point. But um, if you could join me in just thanking Shai for all his time.